joined by a legend, Sean Thompson. Uh, for those that are not with it, Sean is probably one of the most 10 influential surfers of all time. Uh, I'm sure that ranking will move up, but uh, this guy's done it all from winning winning the uh, the world championship to uh, best-selling books to a phenomenal leadership speaker uh, on life. He's spoken to uh, to companies, to groups, and the one I love, he's a uh, activist. Uh, the f- were you, you were the first professional surfer to be on the board of directors for uh, Surf Rider Foundation. Is that right? Yeah, I was. Yeah, yeah. I was actually with the first uh, first pro surfer member. The first one. I think I was the first member. In fact, <laughs> dude, you, you know, maybe it was my time in uh, in California when I was growing up. But that was, I mean, the Surf Rider Foundation. I remember giving to that as a kid. Uh, you know, growing up in Santa Cruz, uh, it seems like it's. I don't want to say it's lost steam. Is is Surf Rider still as big as it is? Yeah, it's still really it's still really big. Actually, I was so honored they gave me an award called the Wave Maker Award a, a few months back for my uh, for my contribution. But you know, one of the things that I think is amazing about Surfrider, and for anyone that's listening, is they have a really simple mission, and it's like a one line mission statement to preserve and protect the world's waves, oceans, and beaches. And you know that mission has resonated with millions and millions of people across the world. And I think for anyone that's in business or thinking about going in business, it's good to have a simple mission that you can put on a T-shirt, like one line. Yeah. I, I, dude, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, you know, hey, I go with what I know, uh, SEAL for, for most of my career. And they wrote this beautiful ethos or code, whatever you want to call it. And it reads beautifully, but it's like fair, five paragraphs and nobody can memorize it. Um, yeah. When, when things are simple, man, they, they, they resonate. But uh, Sean, I, I do want to go back because, you know, you have an interesting story. Uh, you know, there, there's, there's, there's South Africans that are, uh, are professional surfers, uh, definitely still today. Um, but, you know, you grew up surfing in South Africa. Of course, you're South African uh, native. But then you had to step into Hawaii, I believe. When was your first trip to Hawaii? If, so my if first read- trip to Hawaii was 1969. It was actually a bar mitzvah present. My dad took me over there. My dad had loved Hawaii his entire life. He actually got exposed to Hawaii when he was about 23 years old. He had a very, he was very badly attacked by a shark in South Africa, nearly killed him. He was a champion swimmer. He was maybe going to win an Olympic gold. Shark destroyed his career. And he he went to San Francisco to your old hometown for hand surgery to the leading hand surgeon in the world. And then they sent him off to Hawaii to recuperate. And he met the Kahanamoku family, this legendary swimming family. Uh, when he was staying on the beach at this hotel called the Royal Hawaiian. And he just fell in love with Hawaii and what Hawaii represented. And he passed the love of surfing and the love of Hawaii onto me. And then I went there at a very young age and, and I had pictures of Hawaii all over my bedroom. And, you know, my dream was one day to, to try to be uh, one of the best surfers in the world. And the way to do it was to go to Hawaii and ride what were then the biggest waves in the world. And it all happened on the North shore in Hawaii. And so what was it like to step from the surf of South Africa to Hawaii? I mean, did you have to elevate your game? Absolutely to- elevate your game. It's like going from uh, driving around in uh, bumper cars to like F1. You, you know, the the difference in the speed, the power. Also, uh, you know, while in South Africa, like, you know, everyone knew me, in uh, in Hawaii, I was like the bottom of the food chain. So, you know, I had to like, get respect from the locals and I had to learn how to ride these big terrifying waves, you know, waves that had pictures on my wall of waves that uh, you'd paddle out and, you know, you'd see someone that's just been savaged on the coral reef. So there's a lot of, um, you know, there was a lot of fear and having to overcome that fear, but, but I always had that, that passion and that drive to, to paddle out. And obviously, you know, winning was important to, to have that desire to win, but I always wanted every wave to represent the best uh, that I could surf it. I, I had that, um, I had that mindset even from a young age. Every wave, I surfed it as hard as I could, uh, in a good way. You know, not not in a uh, a purely athletic way, but a, a athletic combined with spirituality. Because surfers get very connected to the environment, and you know, you're sitting out there and you're waiting for a wave, and you're chilling, and there's dolph. Like even yesterday, I was in the water. There's dolphins and seagulls and seals. It's, you know, you really feel that you, you're part of the broader universe. So, yes, 
there's the hardcore athleticism and the aggression and the power, but also there's the softer side, the spiritual side. It's nice to have that blend. Without a doubt, man. Uh, you know, especially when you hit a dusk or a dawn, it, that those on the waves, those, those are the most scenic times, and it's just peaceful. Um, you, you talked about earning the respect of the uh, the locals. I, I know that can be a pretty cutthroat environment. Was that a, was that a major obstacle to overcome, or, or did it you get was, uh, welcome pretty quick? You know, it was it was uh, it was it was scary because there was a perception for a couple of years there that by coming over there and wanting to change it from a lifestyle into a sport to professionalize mm-hmm. it, and kind of winning winning all the comps, uh, that in some ways that. The Aussies, which were much louder yeah. than the South Africans, yeah. you know, uh, and were really sort of uh, uh, talking about their achievements, like the beautiful Aussies do, and I love the Aussies more than any other nation in the world. Um, so it did create some antagonism and some resentment, and there was beefs, and the Aussies, you know, got got punched out and um, had to uh, kind of a, a, apologize. And then the following year, like I sort of escaped it. Because I thought in my mind I was such a good bloke, but the following year I was interviewed in, in a magazine. Do you remember Penthouse magazine? It was like a super racy, like no, label. no, no, no clue what you're talking about. I've never seen it in gritty. my life. So the dude, of course, the, the of course dude inter- did. He interviewed yeah. me in the magazine, and he mentioned the, this group of real tough guys. They called the Black Shorts, and uh, they had a perception that I'd written the article and that I'd written about their kind of nefarious activities. So I got beefed, and then uh, I had so many death threats, I had to go and um, <clears throat> I had to drive out to Tropic Lightning, which is in Wahiwa. It's, a, it's a, a base, and I had to go into the local gun shop. And I remember going up to the, the gun store owner and said, hey, these guys, are they gnarly dudes, man? They want to kill me. I said, I need some protection. And he, I'm a tourist. I'm a tourist. I'm like 23 years old, a tourist. And he shows me the wall where all the weapons are, you know, AR-15, all the M-16 lookalikes, and then the big, you know, 44 Magnums, 357s. He said, but this is not for you. This is what you need. And he brings out a Remington pump action. And he says, you can hold off an army with this, buddy. <laughs> Huge, big shells. They look like rocket-powered grenades. And I carried that around with me for a while until we had a big peace treaty. And we had a big meeting and 80 of the... Um, 80 of the best surfers in Hawaii came to support me and, and it was a misunderstanding and it was all resolved and, and, and then we all went on our peaceful way. But the early, early days in surfing were certainly rough and rugged and, you know, we had to get some slaps and punches, uh, but that's the way it was. You know, we copped it. We never left the island. We uh, stood up for ourselves and we explained that to us, the Hawaiian surfers were the gods and that uh, Hawaii was the center of surfing and always would be, and there was never any uh, disrespect uh, intentionally or unintentionally. Um, but, we, but we understood, you know, we understood that, man, Hawaii's had a tough time. It's been colonized. It was illegally annexed by the United States. So, you know, you've got to put yourself in the shoes of um, the Hawaiians. And at that time, there was a whole, it was sort of the start of the rebirth Mm-hmm. of, of uh, Hawaii and the re- they called it the Renaissance um, and it was wonderful to be a part of it but we got some licks <laughs> <laughs> well, the death threats that's, that's insane dude it seems a little unnecessary but um, I, I guess it's, if it's their home turf and they felt slighted well these were, um, these were, these were exceptionally um, they were tough guys they, they, yeah. they, they were very, uh, very tough guys and, and uh, you know it was very scary to get on the wrong side of them, but luckily it was all resolved. And, and now, um, you know, now it's just part of history. We can laugh about it. <laughs> do, do they consider you part of the Hawaiian surf history now? Yeah. Just you know, we're part of, of Hawaiian surfing history. And, and, you know, I think that when we helped uh, develop surfing, uh, the Aussies and the South Africans and some of the young Hawaiian pros, it was good for everyone in surfing. You know, there was no one, uh, you know, young guys in Hawaii and all over the world, Australia, California are making a great living from being pro surfers and going surfing. They just had this incredible event in Hawaii uh, called the Eddie Aikau Invitational, which was in memory of one of the greatest uh, Hawaiian yeah. surfers of yes. all time, uh, a guy called Eddie Aikau. And in fact, Eddie Aikau came to South Africa to compete 
Now, when I grew up in South Africa, I was 16, I think, when he came. South Africa was a segregated society. It yeah. was called the apartheid yes. regime. Yes. It was segregated. And uh, Eddie came there. He was invited out there because he was one of the greatest servers in the world. And he was denied entry at a hotel called the Malibu Hotel. How about that? The Malibu Hotel. And they deny entry, the manager, to one of the greatest servers in the world. So my dad and I picked him up and he came and stayed with us. And uh, we introduced him to this wonderful Australian family, the Holmes family. And, you know, he really, I think, fell in love and never forgot the, the aloha that, that, that some people in South Africa gave to him and the Australians gave to him. So Eddie was a peacekeeper and a peacemaker in these uh, conflicts that, that we had. And unfortunately, we lost him in, in 1978. He was uh, on a boat that was recreating a voyage between... Hawaii and Tahiti. It was like an ancient craft called the Hokulea, mm -hmm. and it started uh, sinking. And in the middle of the night, he jumped on his red board and he paddled out into the dark to look for help. And, and, never and they never again. found him and they never found his board. So it's, it's a tragic story, but a story of courage. That's, uh, that's, a, that's a great story that he was, he, would, uh, he was denied, but you said he fell in love with South Africa from a surf aspect. Well, I think some South, South Africans, you know, obviously he had a very bad experience there. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but he he, you know we we reached out a hand to him and you know we 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 were we were also traumatized by that experience and and in many ways it sort of opened my eyes to sort of the injustice that was a daily uh, yeah. daily occurrence for for the black community in South Africa. Um, but he was a great guy. He was a cool dude. Uh, so I know you you were definitely known for creating a style of surf uh, again with with the way you'd punch in and out of the tube, but. How, how much did you get into the big, uh, you know, surf riding? Was, was that a passion of yours or yeah, were you we, more we, focused on the competitions? We were focused on, uh, on, uh, on being the best at any size, you know, whether it was 25 feet or whether it was, was two feet. In Hawaii, you know, there was, not, there was no, like, to, all these big waves in Tahiti hadn't been discovered. These big, big waves in California, like Mavericks, hadn't been discovered. Nazare hadn't been discovered in Portugal. It was all about yeah. the North Shore. So all of us young guys... Uh, you know, we wanted to be the best no matter what the size and no matter what competition was held, we'd go for it. So we, we were young and aggro, but, you know, we weren't like, I wouldn't say that we were committed big wave specialists and that, mm -hmm. that's all we did. Big wave was just a part of it. It was just like there's no difference between a 25-foot wave and, a, and an 8-foot wave. You know, we'd try to hit it as hard as um, you could, but we didn't do one to the exclusion of the other. It wasn't, wasn't like, oh, well, we're just going to focus on small waves or we – just going to focus on big waves. We focus on everything. And I try to be really versatile. I try to surf anything. And I try to surf anything as, as, as good as I could. But I really like the, um, the performance walls. You know, when, yeah. like there's a place called Sunset Beach when it was about 12 to 15 feet and you had a big wall. Waimea Bay was the biggest wave in the world at the time. It was like a huge mm -hmm. drop, sort of just like a straight line drop. But Sunset was all about performance, big bottom turns, big calves, tube rides. So it was it was a pretty uh, technical wave, and that was more of, um, I think, a true test of um, one skill set as opposed to just the courage the courage aspect. My mayor was like fire up the courage and paddle over the edge, like pipeline too. You know, um, pipeline is is uh, perhaps I, I would say the most dangerous wave in the world. Even today, even with all these other waves that have been discovered, more people have died there than anywhere else, and that's really the true test of a of a man or a woman, you, know, you paddle over that edge and you look down at that black coral of death. I tell you what, that defines you. Did you love it? Yeah, I loved it, man. You loved yeah, pipeline? I, I was there. I won my first, uh, I think I became the youngest guy to win the pipeline masters. Um, and it was a big thrill for me because my father was on the beach with me, you know, he'd, and okay, he never won the gold medal because of the shark attack, but yeah. to see his son, and I was a co sort of pretty much an unknown guy then. Uh, when it it was like um it was like obviously it was a dream come true for me but in some ways it might have it was like a dream come true for my dad it was, so that was that was pretty cool but that that wave today you ask any surfer like what's a true test what contest pipeline. would you like to win more than any other and they'll say you know the pipeline masters which is going on right now actually kelly slater who's 50 years old is competing which is amazing and uh, last year he won it and and you know he could become uh, I mean, he's an icon and an amazing surfer, but he could even become by greater by winning it this year again. Yeah. And, and, and you've been a, a bit of a mentor 
to, to, to Kelly along the way? Um, I think perhaps in, in some ways in my approach and in my philosophy, um, I think, uh, you know, for all the, all the acclaim that Kelly has had, he, he still has, um, he's still humble. He's still engaging. He still likes to be around people. He likes to, to give back. And also I think he's, he's very thoughtful and multidimensional. It's not just about surfing. You know, I thought that was really important. I went back, you know, I went back to university. I was studying at university when I was on the tour. I created my first company when I was 22 years old, tried to get involved in environmental movements. You know, I felt that when you do a number of things, it makes your single passion even stronger, stronger. and you, you, you're even better at it. So he's certainly done some amazing stuff outside of just surfing. And he's created this amazing wave machine and he's done some really, really cool things. I know we've, we've, we've got one here in Austin, but I mean, in a lot of ways, I, I know Kelly was the face of our generation. I mean, uh, Absolutely. I, I'm sure you love the, uh, you're, you're humble. You don't like the accolade, but uh, you know, it said with his rugged, good looks, his eloquence and undeniable athleticism, Sean Thompson very much became the face of, uh, surfing in the uh the 70s 80s uh pre kelly slater oh, that's um, funny. what you know as you look back man on on your contributions to to the sport what what really comes to mind first uh, you know uh, maybe, maybe a couple of things i, I think um I, I developed a whole new approach to riding inside the tube which is the best yeah. part of surfing yeah you ask any surfer, like, what's the best moment? It's riding inside the tube, inside that spinning tunnel of water when you think you can. Uh, I used to think that I could actually curve that wall to my will. You know, when you're really focused in that state of flow uh, and you're operating on instinct. I actually called my first apparel company Instinct because, yes. you know, that was sort of the essence of the, of the tube ride experience. So I think I, you know, I created new lines riding the tube, created new lines at, at, at Pipeline as well. And, and then I think I brought a, a high level of professionalism to surfing and helped um, and helped it, it thrive and prosper and give back. And then I think my environmental consciousness is, you know, I think that was a contribution. And, and I think a lot of surfers went, wow, you know, we need to be more environmentally conscious. We need to give back. We need to, uh, you know, we, we need to give back to the ocean. And then, you know, the mentoring, which I've loved throughout my career, I sponsored two Australians, two world titles, a guy called Tom Carroll to two world titles, a guy called Barton Lynch to one. And, you know, I like to think that, that I helped them and had an impact on their career. And um, in more recent times, I, I, I managed to help hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people. So it's a wonderful extension of, you know, what I did when I was a young, a young guy um, and now sort of doing it on a different and, and, and bigger scale. You know, I went back to, I've got, to, I've got to tell you this, I went back to grad school at university a number of years ago, back. I think I was the oldest dude there. And I wanted to study influence and inspiration. So that's what leadership is, the art and science of leadership. And, you know, when I thought back to my athletic career and, and I look at what does an athlete really do? Like, what does an athlete really do? There's two fundamental responsibilities. One is to win. And the other one that is even more important is to inspire. And that's what athletes do. And it's, it, it, it's, it's wonderful to have gone and studied this concept of influence and inspiration in depth and see the incredible power that athletes have, not just to inspire and influence, but to transform, to transform people through their obviously through the exploits on the field, but also the exploits off the field. That is probably the best definition uh, I've ever heard. Um, you know, Sean, the one thing we have in common, but I assure you, you are much better than I is, uh, you know, I have a leadership development company and I speak to companies as well, but, you know, I often say I use the football analogy. It doesn't matter how inspiring a coach is or what type of uh, great culture he may build if he's not putting wins on the board, he's not going to be yeah. in that seat very long. So the winning part has, I mean, everyone wants to be a part of a winning culture uh, and Absolutely. you can't have one with the, without the other, but the mentorship piece, you know, you, you took the sport to a level and then, you know, you hear it with same with the athletes in any, any profession, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, 
you know, they, they took the sport to another level, and now you watch this generation taking it further. Does that hurt your ego whatsoever? Or do you feel like, nope, I've done my job, we've mentored them, and now they're taking the sport to a level we, I love we it. couldn't I, comprehend? I, you know, I, I love the development, and I take great pride in knowing that I put a little brick awesome. in the wall of surfing. Yeah. So for me, um, you know, my records were broken many years ago and, and and i go that's just part of the that's part of the development of the sport you know you have to and and you know sometimes an athlete will phone me up and and my door's always open to athletes and my advice yeah. is always uh it's it's caring and it's free i always say to athletes you, you, you got a problem phone me up and I, I mean this young hawaiian athlete a few years back great kid his name was zeke lao he looks like a warrior um, he couldn't get out of 25th place, could not get out of 25th place. So I contacted him and I said, Hey Zeke, uh, you know, I'm Sean Thompson. Yeah, I'm stoked to connect with you. I said, listen, I've got this super cool method that I, I use with hundreds of thousands of people. You know, I'd love you to try it. And you know, maybe it can give you a little breakthrough because athletics, it's about millimeters. Do you know what I mean? The difference between success and failure is a millimeter and, and both, in your physical makeup and also in your mental makeup, you know, just one little millimeter can mean the difference between success and failure. So I said, this is, this is the thing. This is the way of the warrior. So it's cool. Uh, you know, you've got your everyday warrior. And I said, I said, that's what I wrote him. This is the way of the warrior, the code. This is your values. This is your power. This is your passion. This is your purpose. Write 12 lines, every line beginning with our will, write it in 15 minutes and commit to this. I will what? I will. And he writes his 12 lines. He sends it to me. I promise you, the next week he flies to South Africa. So I won a big event in South Africa when I was 17 years old. I won it six times in a row. It was called the Gunston 500. It's still going. He gets a third. Like you say, he goes from 25th to third. And a month later, he gets a first in a, a big event in Portugal and qualifies for the professional tour at the end of that year. So I, I say to people that this code process that, I, that, that, that is to be shared in the world, it's open source code. It might help you, it might not help you, but what's the risk? The risk is 15 minutes. Pick up a pen, write 12 lines. Every line begins with our will. And I think over a million, a pe million people have done this code process. I do it with the biggest companies in the world. I do it with, I did it with a group of soldiers in Israel, PTSD survivors. I've done it with prisoners, inmates. I've done it with rehab clinics, uh, schools, universities, and massive corporations. Everyone writes a code, baby, 12 lines. Every line beginning with our will. And you know, you know, you are Exil. You know how important it is to have that foundation of values, to have the foundation of commitment, to have at your heart purpose. Like, what am I going to do? What am I about? What's my life? What's the meaning of my life? I will have faith. I will be better today than I was yesterday. Whatever. People write amazing stuff. You cannot believe what they write, Mark. Sometimes I cry when I read what they write. Yeah. And they stand up. You know what they do when I do these events? People stand up and they read their code out loud and proud. They're like a warrior. They read it and, and half of the audience will start crying when they hear what their team members have, 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 have written. It is so, it is so wonderful. I, I, I think I've got one of the best jobs in the world right now. <laughs> we, so, you know, you have a story to tell and a very unique story, a world-class story. And, and I heard it recently and it, it, I can't, I can't remember the source. They said, it is a shame to not share your story, which is to say, to share all the knowledge you've accumulated. And usually a lot of that knowledge comes from failure trials and tribulations. Uh, and if you don't pass that to the next generation, you're actually doing a disservice to humanity. Uh, Sean, this is, and so for everyone listening, Sean wrote a bestseller and this is what I love. It was a teen, the number one Amazon teen bestseller called, uh, the code, the power of, I will Sean, this is why I love it because four of my buddies, I, I write with my buddies. I, I, I'm very team oriented. Everything I've done is, is team oriented. Uh, we just went and jumped the seven continents, uh, <laughs> skydived in six days no one's ever done this they said it couldn't be done so we you know Gnarly. i went and found nine nine of my buddies but we talk about how often companies have like their corporate values on the wall 
and I often, you know, when I speak to companies, I'm like, and I'm, I'm, I haven't spoke cause I've been gone for 45 days on this expedition, but, uh, honor, integrity, communication, and service. And I, I asked people, I'm like, what company had those values up on the wall? And some people will get it right away. I said, Hey, uh, one of their major headquarters was in Houston and they'll, they'll finally yell out Enron. And I'm like, yeah, you know what guys, every corporation has values on the wall. But how many companies do you see that actually have a code? Like, if you didn't know it, Johnson & Johnson is one of the few companies that if you walk into their headquarters, it's actually etched on the wall wow, uh, that's in amazing. stone. But so you, you know, know what code, you say, go ahead. What you say is amazing. You know, I when I went back and, 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 and went back to grad school and studied leadership, I actually got hold of the Enron book on values. It, it was about half an inch thick. All this shit was inside this book. So, so you know, so you know what I do with 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 companies, and, and it's it's super cool. So now, so you've got a big crew, and everyone mm -hmm. reads their code. And I, I say to people, okay, I want one line from your code that is the most resonant line to you, and send it to me. They text it to me, and it comes up, comes up on my PowerPoint. And, you know, whatever that line might be like, I will live a life of integrity. I will have faith. I yes. will be a mentor. But it's about power and it's about commitment and it's about I will. And when you state that in front of people, you know, you have that, you know, you're in the military, you have that accountability. Yeah. And then what I do afterwards, then I, I have an artist who puts it together and he makes a big poster. And there's a one line from each team member, and that goes whether it's to company HQ or goes to the sales office. So now, like you say, when you walk into a company and you see honor, integrity, words, let me tell you, words don't have the power. But when you put our will in front of them, it creates urgency, it creates action, and it creates commitment. And you know what it is? It's a bloody promise. You've made a promise. And you know who you've made the promise to? to yourself. So you better uphold it. Otherwise you'll be a bloody wanker. So everyone, you know, when, when you see these commitments and, and I go into the companies and I see them up on the walls and I go, that's ah, pretty cool. You know what I mean? They're, like you're not going to check them out every day, but maybe the one day when you're down and things are going sideways and you look there and you see, you see one of your words from your code, like I will always paddle back out or, or, you know, whatever it, what, whatever it might be, it, it can give you, that little extra millimeter. It, so, you know, again, we, we, we talked about Enron. Those were espoused values, what we, we, we aspire to be. But I love this concept of a code. And there was a book called The Code of a Warrior uh, by a professor at the Naval Academy. And I remember reading it as a young Marine before he became a SEAL. And I don't know why it resonated with me in my 40s as much as it did in my 20s. But you know, in a lot of ways, I didn't realize I was living by a code. I couldn't articulate it. But have you ever, I, I've got to ask you, have you ever heard the prayer of Tecumseh? I think it's one of the best codes. No, I don't think I have, but maybe I have. So I, I, it's something I used to say with my son before he went to bed. And, and it's, it's, it's been a little while, but, but, but bear with me. Live your life so that the fear of death may never enter your heart. Trouble no one about his religion. Respect others and their views and demand that they respect yours. Love your life. Perfect your life. Beautify all things in your life. Seek to make your life long and of service to your people. When your time comes to die, be not like those whose hearts are filled with the fear of death, so they weep and pray for a little more time to live their lives over again in a different way. Sing your death song and die like a hero going home. I, I probably wow, messed that up. Amazing. Hey, well done there, Mike. That is awesome. Hey. It, it would be, there was a time where my son could say it, with me. And of course, at the age of five, he had help him, but he knew it pretty, pretty uh, routinely. He doesn't That's know now because we stopped. But when you have something like that, you live your life a little bit differently. And, and it also goes to the, the to, to habits of repeating those codes until it becomes instinctual. It, it's something it's, it's etched into your mind. Why have you chosen? And I know you're still, still active in the sport, you know, you, you've written these books on leadership. Is this part of your legacy you're leading behind, man? Is, it, is, is, this, is this the next chapter of your life is to impact as many lives through, through your leadership training as, yeah, as you did in surfing? Without a doubt. I mean, I, 
But a tragedy led me to this. I lost my beautiful 15 and a half year old son to a poor choice in 2006. He played a dangerous game that he heard about at school called the choking game. It was terrible. Yeah. And um, I just went down a different path after that. And, and I could see that, um, you know, young people, not just young people, people are, are, um, people just make bad decisions all the time. And if there's a way that I, in my own way, can help people make a better decision and live a better life by using my, my method, which I've found really helps people discover hope and activate purpose. It gives me so much um, love back and so much satisfaction and, and makes, you know, what happened to my beautiful son, um, much more, I think I speak about my son a lot when I, when, when I, when I do my presentations and um, how important to, it, it is to, if you have a loss and you suffer, is, is you've got to find your new purpose. You've got to find a renewed purpose. And, and for me, my renewed purpose was, well, maybe I'll go out and speak to people and give them two things. I give them a perspective and tell them about my experiences through some stories. And then I'll show them how to activate the code method and they share it and they do it together and just create this wave of optimism, optimism and hope. And when I, when I do my presentations, it's, it's really interesting because they're quite interactive. And even if I'm doing a live stream and it's to five or 6,000 people, I ask people right at the end after they've written their codes and shared them, so what are you going to take home with you? Send me one word. Send me one word that you're going to take home with you. What do you think that word is, Mike? Inspire. That, that, that's a common word, but the most common word is hope, which is very related to inspire. And, you know, if that's my mission in life now, and if that's the ultimate objective, it's a good mission. It's a good path to help people find hope it's cool sean I, I i wasn't gonna bring up matthew um and and a lot of people just don't like to talk about loss it requires what i consider to be the most masculine trait and that's vulnerability and again you know you're right it, it, the most the most lethal warriors i knew I, I talk about them and how vulnerable they were um not victims but they they'd allowed themselves to be vulnerable you said you started to go down a bad path after, after Matthew? Um, well, you know, I, 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 it was just despair, despondency, um, no direction. It was very, uh, like, for instance, you know, I love surfing so much. And I was so stoked. And after I lost Matthew, my stoke had gone out. You know, the fire, my fire had gone out. So it was, it was a tough time. And then, and then how about this? I had this friend who kept phoning me up. Hey, Sean, I want to take you surfing. You've got to go surfing again. You've got to go surfing again. After a couple of months, he takes me surfing. He said, Sean, I'm going to take you to a place you've never surfed before. So we walked down and I'm back in the homeland of South Africa because my son was at my old private school and they wore... They wore uniforms and they wore school ties. And he played this game called the choking game with his school tie. I mean, all the kids were playing it as yeah. dreadful. I dreadful remember. Yeah. So he takes me to this place and we walk down these steps and it's, it's beautiful. The sun is just starting to rise and it's on the East Coast. So the sun's like boiling up through the ocean. It's a beautiful, sense, a beautiful thing to see. And I just felt this sort of sense of um, like a new day, like renewal. And I dived into the water with my board and I paddled out and I was crying, you know. And then the waves were just washing into me as I was paddling out. And they were just like washing my tears away. It was an amazing sensation to be, you know, crying. And then the waves are washing them away. It's like the sea is helping me. And then I paddled out and I could feel Matthew was with me, man. Yeah. And then I swung around and I caught a wave and I rode it. And I started feeling better and I paddled back out and I rode another wave. And then I paddled up to my mate. And I said, hey, what's the name of this wave? Because, you know, every surfing break has a name. 
She said it's called Sunrise. Sunrise. How about that? I couldn't believe it. I went, wow. This is um, there's something at work here. Deep faith and connectivity to Matthew, connectivity to nature, and, and connectivity back to my surfing. And it was like my stoke was relit then. And then I went down a path. I had a book at the printer, my first book, and and I, I told them to keep it on hold. I, I didn't want to publish it. And, and then I knew, now I've got to publish this book because this book's in memory of Matthew, and the book was called Surface Code, and it was about the first 12 lines I'd written. And and it turned into this, this book turned into this way to honor my beautiful son's life and, and, and to help me find a new path. And that's what I did. And that's what I've been doing ever since. You know, I've been pushing forward and, and doing now what, what has, has become a passion for me. I, I love to speak to people and share my perspective and share my code. What is it about nature? Because, you know, I know, I know you, you come from a, a Judaism, uh, Jewish background. Uh, you know, I came from a very devoutly Roman Catholic family. But in the wake of war and losing brothers, I didn't find renewal through religion. Um, and you've often heard the phrase, nature is next to, uh, to godliness. Uh, a trip to, to Mount Everest uh, for me just was it was time to put down my grief, the survivor's guilt for my brothers and actually honor their life by living to, 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 to do more, to be more. What is it about nature in your opinion? You talked about spirituality and I believe in three pillars, you know, the physical, the mental and the spiritual. What is it about nature that is so spiritual to, to I, I think for some it's, yeah, it's go climb it, a mountain, man. It's, it's, you know, for me, it's that feeling of humility, that feeling of disconnection and connection. So like yesterday, I go surfing, walk down the beach, and there's a person in the water, one person and me. And I walk down the beach, and I jump into the water. And as I jump into the water, there's a moment there, every surf experiences it. You sort of weightless for a moment, and then you sort of, go down in the water. So it's like you, you, you fly. You fly from the land into the sea, and now you're in the sea. And you, I paddle out. The person paddles, and now I'm sitting out there all by myself, just looking at that beautiful dome of sky, and like waiting for my wave. Boom! Next to me, right next to me, the seal explodes up in the water. And it's looking around, and I go, I thought it was a shark, you know. Cause, because when you're <laughs> out there by yeah. yourself, you think of, of shark. And then, yeah. bang, the seal disappears. Go, shit, man, maybe a shark is put in the seal and, and I'm looking around. Next thing there's an explosion and two seals bob out the water. I'm going, what is this? So now I'm like very, I'm very nervous. I'm looking around and every seagull or every splash, I think it's, I think it's a fin. So I'm sort of chill, chilling now and I'm like communing with nature and I'm breathing and breathing that, that salt air and boom, a fin comes out the water. It's like, 15 feet from me. I, I nearly fainted, Mike. I nearly fainted. And then I see it's a dolphin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I thought you were going to say that. But it's, but, you know, that feeling of being insignificant, I think is good because, you know, we all think we're so damn important and, you know, we got it all down. And uh, But then you paddle out and you, you just feel disconnected but connected and you feel humble. You don't feel humiliated. You just feel humble and humbled. And it's a good feeling to not be in control. I said the same thing about Everest. Uh, one, I, so the, the, the disconnected yet connected thing, that's, I think, especially this day and age with how inundated we are with technology, that, that's even yeah. increasingly important. But when I, somebody asked me to describe the terrain because we did a documentary on Everest called Drop Zone Everest. Uh, I said, I've never felt so insignificant or so small in a good way. Uh, and that is, I mean, that terrain was like nothing I've ever seen. And, and sure, 29,000 so, feet. That is rad. And we got to skydive in, which was, uh, was cool. Um, and, and like what, 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 so what height, what, what altitude did you land at? 
So they're the highest drop zones in the world, which puts us in a group of about 20 people that have jumped in that, uh, that terrain. And of course, people are like, oh my God, he jumped onto Everest. I'm like, no, no one's that dumb. You, you don't jump onto Everest. Uh, no one's done it yet. Um, but we would exit on oxygen around 23 to 24,000 feet. Wow. And the drop zones were at anywhere from 17.5 to 20,000. I didn't get to do the one on 20,000. That was the more experienced crew and they were, they were more deserving than I was, but, um, you're not experiencing much free fall time. You're exiting out of the, uh, the helicopter and then pretty much going right to your, your, uh, your BOC, uh, to, to, to pull your, uh, your, your shoot. Um, but it was the time under canopy just doing three sixties was, was some of the best moments of, uh, of, of my life, man. I mean, that view must be like mind boggling. Oh, it was that, great. That, that vista must be just so like beyond. I, I've, so I've got to take, I've got to take not only my wife and my family back, but, uh, there's, there's some of my brothers again, who are better jumpers than I am that are more deserving that, that need that spiritual experience. We're, we're going to get yeah. them back there. So we are going back to, uh, to Everest. Hey man, I, I've Sean, I've got to come see you speak. And, uh, you know, I know companies pay you to come out. If there's ever an op opportunity for me to come see you speak, man. Oh, I think I'd, love, I, I'd love to have you there, Mark. And I'd love to, you know, stay more connected because, you know, I love what you're doing, uh, you know, helping um, helping vets uh, find their next phase, find their next wave. Uh, I, um, you know, when they've, they, they've gone and risked their lives for, um, for their countries and no matter what political persuasion, you are there's that core of, of positive values and that uh, morality and integrity and it's it's you know if there's anything that I can do in any way that I can can help um, you know your crew your tribe with uh, with pleasure because sometimes you know a completely different off the wall perspective can give people an interesting insight and perspective into their own lives because sometimes there's something there that I might talk about that they have thought about but maybe not really considered and then the code works for everyone the code doesn't matter whether you're a whether you're a warrior whether you're a, an accountant whether you're a you know whether you're a, a student from a poor school in south africa the code has has great power and i think it would have resonance for your tribe i you know I, I i call it warriors within their respective professions warrior has nothing to do with the profession of arms it has everything to do with the mindset and how you live mm -hmm. your life um so i, I want to close it out with this man um one I, you know, I, I'm going to swear bullshit. I, I, I hate just the, the, the chitter chatter bullshit where people say things and don't fall through part of the code. I love how you talked about accountability. I will. And then you hold yourself accountable, uh, accountable because you've made a yeah. pledge. So guys, and we'll make sure the links are to these two books. The one is the code, the power of, I will, and I'm picking it up. And then the next one, uh, is the bestseller you had the surface code, the 12 simple lessons of writing through life. But there's a brand new one out. There's a brand yes. new, it's called, it's called The Surfer and the Sage. So that just came out a couple months ago. And, and uh, you yeah, the surfer, know, The Surfer and the Sage, it's, it's a cool one, yeah. You got, you got a copy there? Okay. Yeah, it, it, what's, what's the genesis, uh, a guide to surf Survive ride? and ride life's waves. So this was written during COVID. It's to help people go from the darkness to the light. 18 chapters, because 18 in uh, Hebrew, the word is chai, it means life. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a book about spirituality, about honor, about integrity, and about how to go from anxious to calm, how to go from despair to hope. So each chapter is a duality. So it's a uh, I think your crew would uh, uh, your crew would dig it. So I'm picking up three books. Um, <laughs> if you don't mind, you know the Surface Quo uh, Code, the Twelve Simple Lessons for Riding Through Life. I'd love to close it out by giving just a few of those or all of those that okay. you find most important in what people can learn from them. And then guys, there's no better way to close out this podcast. Sean, I can't thank you enough. So sir, the floor is yours, man. Thanks Mike. So for anyone out there, when you write your code, I encourage everyone 15 minutes, 12 lines, every line begins with our will keep your code. You spent the time you've made the commitment, keep your code. So I keep my code in my wallet. I keep it right there. So I don't read my code every day, but let me tell you, my words are there for me when I need them. So these are, these are, these are some of my words. I will never turn my back on the ocean. 
That's about passion. I will always paddle back out. Resilience, perseverance, hope too. I will take the drop with commitment, unequivocal courage. I will know that there will always be another wave. Optimism. I will realize that all surfers are joined by one ocean, that we one tribe, that we united. I will paddle around the impact zone. Sometimes the best way is not to go straight ahead into the inferno, but around the, around the side. I will never fight a riptide that all of us, no matter how strong, clever, successful we are, you better be aware of those inexorable trends that run through society that you cannot fight like a riptide. I will watch out for other surfers after a big set. Watch out for your mates. Because one day you're going to be stuck down there and you're going to be hoping one of your mates is going to come and rescue you. I will pass on my stoke to a non-surfer. Just give back. Be a mentor. Uh, this one's so funny. I will ride and not paddle into shore. So when you start something, complete something, and so many guys come up to me and say, hey, Sean, why did you write that? I was late for my wife. I was late for a business appointment. Because, you know, when you're out there surfing, you can't just like, it's time to go paddle in. You've got to ride in. <clears throat> I will catch a wave every day, even in my mind. So that importance of connecting to something you love every day, even if it's just like shutting your eyes and having a vicarious experience. And then the last one, which anyone who has done service for their country, like you have and your tribe has and a lot of your listeners have, I will honor the sport of kings. Honor your passion. Honor your vocation. Honor. Live a life with honor. And that's it. <laughs> I don't think there's any better way to end a podcast. And quite frankly, I don't want to ruin it, Sean. I can't thank you enough for joining the Men's Journal Everyday Warrior Podcast, man. Um, I'm picking up those three books, brother. And uh, I'm so glad we crossed paths. I, I mean, first off, you know, who didn't watch North Shore if you grew up in the, uh, the <laughs> 80s, 90s? I'm sorry to bring it up, but, uh, you know, that's that's a comeback kid story. Um, yeah. Brother, you, you've put a lot of time into this craft and, and how you mentor and impact lives. And for that, uh, I am blessed for having crossed paths with you. And I'm going to put those 12 rules that you just read out as well as the links to these three books. And I'm looking forward to it. And please let me know when there's an opportunity to come see you speak. I think thanks, I Mike. This. What, a, what a pleasure, man. You're a great guy and you've got a lot of positive energy, man. And I, I love uh, I love your philosophy. So I was honored to be on the show. And uh, I know our paths are going to cross again, brother. <laughs> all right, brother. Be good. And for all of you, thank you for joining us. We'll see you next time.